In this video, we will be looking at how to evaluate limits algebraically. So what happens when the graph isn't available? So there's a few different methods that we can use, and one of them is direct substitution. So when you're finding the limit and you're given a function, like a polynomial, for example, or a rational function and the value that you're approaching isn't where you know there's going to be a hole or an asymptote, you can just directly sub in that specific value and see what you get. Or you could also just use logic when you are evaluating a limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity of a function. So like what happens if I have 5 divided by infinity or infinity divided by a number and you're using logic to evaluate the limit itself. So let's start with our first example. The limit as x approaches 2 of this quadratic. Well, I know a parabola, there's nothing that breaks in it or there aren't any holes, so the left side and right side limits will always match. So directly subbing in the value of 2 is very safe. Because when I do that, I'm really just finding the y value when x equals 2. And when I do that, I'm going to have 4 minus 6 plus 1, which is negative 1. For the next one, the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x plus 8 over 2x plus 4. Now, I know there would be a restriction on this function where x cannot be equal to negative 2, but I'm finding the value when x is greater than 0 or as x approaches 0. So let's see. We can sub in the square root of 0 plus 8 over 2 times 0 plus 4. That's going to be 8 over 4, which is 2, so we get the square root of 2. Next, the limit of 3 as x approaches negative 6. Well, if you're thinking of the function y equals 3, that's just a horizontal line. So from the left over the right, the limit will be 3. Next, the limit as x approaches negative 4 of that rational function the restriction on it is that x can't be negative 6, so negative 4, I have no problem with it. So negative 4 plus 4, or negative 4 plus 6, that's 0 over 2, which is just 0. Next, the limit as x approaches 0 of 5 over x. Well, if I actually try to sub it in, I would have 5 divided by 0, and that's undefined. So here, substitution isn't great. I'm going to think a little bit, though, and see, well, why is it undefined? Well, this is a rational function, the base rational function, 1 over x, that has been vertically stretched by a factor of 3 or 5. So this is what the function would look like. Well, as x approaches 0 from the left, we're going to negative infinity. From the right, we're going to positive infinity. So that contradiction tells us it does not exist. Next, the limit as x approaches infinity of 5 over x. So here, let's think what would happen. If I take a number, like 5, it's pretty small, and I divide it by a larger and larger number, 5 divided by 100, 5 divided by 1,000, 5 divided by a million, what happens to that number? It gets closer and closer to 0. So then, here we are. I'm using my logic. Or I could also think about the function itself. Look at the little sketch I just drew. As x approaches infinity, we have an asymptote that we're approaching. We're approaching 0. So here we're using logic or our knowledge of what that graph looks like. Next, the limit as x approaches infinity of x over 5. So now let's think. I'm going to take a really big number and divide by 5. So let's say 10 divided by 5, 1,000 divided by 5. A million, 10 million divided by 5. As I do that, I get a larger and larger number. So the limit as x approaches infinity of x over 5 is infinity. Now, again, infinity is not actually a number, so you might also see this as the limit just does not exist. But for the purpose of putting a little bit more thought into it, we will say that the limit is infinity. The limit as x approaches infinity of 2 over 3 all to the power of x. So 2 over 3 is 0 0.6 repeated. So think of a number less than 1, and you're multiplying it by itself over and over again. When you multiply a number between 0 and 1 by itself, you get something smaller 
and smaller and smaller the more you multiply it. So this is going to approach zero. We can also think about this visually. This is an exponential function, and because the base is less than one, this is a dk example. So we're approaching zero. Whereas if my base had been greater than one, we would have an exponential growth. Like in the next example, the limit as x approaches infinity of five over two to the power of x, that's going to be infinity. Whether you think about it with the visual or you think about it as, well, 2.5 times itself over and over again, the number's gonna get bigger and bigger. So these were all examples where we're using a bit of logic, we're using our prior graphing knowledge, or we're just subbing in the value we're given. The next strategy is only going to be for rational functions. And that's a strategy for when you're evaluating the limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity. What you're going to do, you're going to look at every term in your rational function and find the term with the highest exponent. And then you're going to divide each term in the numerator and denominator by that highest power. So let's see that in action. The limit as x approaches infinity. Now, when I look at my expression, x squared is the highest power. So I'm going to divide everything in this rational function by x squared. So 2x over x squared minus 3 over x squared all over 5x squared over x squared plus 7 over x squared. If something can be cleaned up, I will clean it up. So the limit as x approaches infinity. Now 2x over x squared, that can be reduced to 2 over x. 3 over x squared cannot. 5x squared over x squared, that's just 5. And then plus 7 over x squared. If anything still remains that is over x, when you do a number divided by infinity, you're going to approach 0. So this approaches 0. This pretty much becomes 0. This pretty much becomes 0 when you think about it long term, as x becomes a really, really, really large number. So then what are we left with? The only thing that wasn't affected is the 5. So in my numerator, I'd have 0. In my denominator, I'd have 5. Well, that's just 0. And if you recall, with rational functions, that's actually your horizontal asymptote. In advanced functions, you would have found it by looking at the coefficients of the terms with the highest exponent. So here, yes, it's x squared. There are no x squares here, so 0 over 5. There it is. But this is actually using the logical, like the reasoning behind why we could use that shortcut. We're using these limits. So let's try the next example. The limit as x approaches infinity of this function I see quadratic and quadratic numerator and denominator, so I'm going to divide everything by x squared. And then I'll clean up whatever can be cleaned up in my next step. So 2x squared over x squared is just 2. 3x over x squared is 3 over x. 1 over x squared is fine. 5x squared over x squared is 5. x over x squared is 1 over x. And then 7 over x squared. And anything that still has that x in the denominator, well, those just become 0. A small number divided by infinity is gets closer and closer to 0. So what are we left with? 2 over 5. And there we are example with this approach my highest exponent is just x to the power of 1 so I'm going to divide everything by x so 4x over x minus 1 over x 3x over x 5 over x and when we clean that up we'll have 4 minus 1 over x and 3 plus 5 over x and even if we're approaching negative infinity it's still the same thing these still become zeros. Negative one divided by a really, really large negative number is still gonna be pretty much zero. So we're just left with four thirds. All right, so that's for rational functions. So we looked at direct substitution using logic or for rational functions when x approaches infinity or negative infinity. Finally, 
What happens when you try to do your direct substitution, but you get an indeterminate form, like you get zero divided by zero or infinity divided by infinity? We have different strategies that we can use. One is factoring, one is rationalizing the numerator or denominator, and one is changing the variable. So let's take a look at our first example. If I were to actually sub in 2 into this expression, to, so 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 2, that would be 0, and then 2 minus 2 is 0. The fact that I get that indeterminate form, I can try one of these strategies. If I got something like 5 over 0, these would not work out. So because I see this is a nice rational function, I just have a quadratic in the numerator, linear in the denominator, I'm going to try the factoring approach. So when I see the x squared minus 3x plus 2, I'm going to factor it to x minus 2 and x minus 1. And then, lucky for us, and if you factor properly, you'll have something that cancels out. And you're actually canceling out the problem there. Because now we're just left with the limit as x approaches 2 of x minus 1. And here, I have no problem with the direct substitution. So once I do my direct substitution, I'm not writing the limit as x approaches 2 anymore because I'm actually evaluating it. And 2 minus 1 is 1. Wonderful. That worked out. The limit as x approaches 5 of x squared minus 25 over x minus 5. Again, if I plug in 5, I will get 0 over 0. So I'm going to try to factor this. And my numerator is a nice difference of squares. So x plus 5, x minus 5, and once again, my problem will cancel out. And I'm left with the limit as x approaches 5 of x plus 5, and now I have no problem with the direct substitution. And we get 10. So that's great. So what we actually found here is what your function is approaching at 2 or at 5, when 2 and 5 were actually holes because they cancelled out. So we actually have holes here, but we can evaluate the limit because the limit is about the behavior, not the actual coordinate itself. Our next two examples, we have some radicals involved. So I have the limit as x approaches 9 of x minus 9 over the square root of x minus 3. If I try to plug in 9, I would get 0 over 0. And when I see this, I don't see those nice polynomials in the numerator and denominator to try to factor. So I'm going to rethink my strategy and I'm going to try to rationalize the denominator. I see a radical. I'm thinking, you know what, let me give this a try. So I look at my denominator and the conjugate to rationalize the denominator will be the same thing. But instead of minus three, I'm going to do plus three. And whatever I do to the bottom, I will do to the top. And now I'll clean it up. So the limit as x approaches 9. The numerator, I'm not going to do any distribution. I'm just going to write it out to copy paste because I'm hoping something will cancel out to solve my problem. But now in the denominator, the square root of x times itself is just going to be x. 3 times itself is 9. It's going to be minus 9. And I don't have to do the outside insides because they cancel out. And then, yay! x minus 9 is common to the numerator and denominator, so we're just left with the limit as x approaches 9 of the square root of x plus 3. And now I don't have a problem with the direct substitution. I can directly sub in 9, the square root of 9 is 3, and when we add that to 3, we get 6. And now we can try the same strategy for the next one, but for this one our radical is in the numerator, and our radical has two terms in the underneath instead of one like we just had, but that's okay. So in this case, instead of rationalizing the denominator, we're going to rationalize the numerator. So I need the conjugate of my numerator. Now, the part that's under the square root, that's not changing. It's still going to be the square root of x plus 1. And then instead of minus 1, we're going to put plus 1. And then I'm going to do that, of course, to the denominator as well. So let's clean this up. The limit as x approaches infinity in my numerator, when I multiply the radical by itself, we'll just be left with the radicand, so x plus 1, and then negative 1 times 1 will be negative 1. All over, 
I'm not going to do any distribution because just like last time, I'm hoping something will cancel out. And it will because 1 minus 1 is 0. So we're going to have the limit as x approaches 0 of x over x times that conjugate. And the x's can cancel out. So our problem disappears again. And now we're taking the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over the conjugate. And this I have no problem doing my direct substitution. So the square root of 0 plus 1 plus 1. And that'll just be 1 half. So this is a really nice strategy whenever you do see a square root in the function that you're trying to find the limit of. All right. Final method is changing the variable. So if we look at our next one, the limit as x approaches 0 of x plus 8 to the power of a third minus 2 over x. When you have something to the power of a third, that's a cube root. I cannot do the conjugate the way I did in the previous examples. So when I look at this, I don't really like this portion here. So I'm going to change it. I'm going to say that I'm going to let a or whatever variable you want equal x plus 8 to the power of a third. So I'm just going to go down here. This is what we're going to have now, the limit. But I can't write x approaches 0 because I'm going to try to write everything about a. So I'm going to leave that blank for now. And then instead of x plus 8 to the power of a third, I'll write a. The minus 2 is fine. And I can't write x in the denominator because I want this all to be about a. So I need to take this here and I'm going to rewrite it. I'm going to isolate for x so I know what I can replace x with. Well, first things first, I'm going to raise both sides to the power of 3. So that way the 1 third times the 3 will become a 1 so that I just have x plus 8. And then I can bring the 8 over and here is what I have. Instead of x, I'm now allowed to write 8 to the power of 3 minus 8. That's great. The only other thing I have to fix here is as x approaches 0. I don't want it to be as x approaches 0. I want it to be as a approaches some number. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to see, well, what does a equal when x is 0? So a will equal 0 plus 8 to the power of a third, so 8 to the power of a third, which is 2. So now what I'm actually evaluating is the limit as a approaches 2 of a minus 2 over a cubed minus 8. Now, if you think we're ready to do direct substitution, you would be wrong, because if we sub in 2, in the numerator we'll get 0, in the denominator we'll also get 0. But the fact that we get that indeterminate form, and this now looks a little better because I don't have any rational exponents, well maybe I'll try to factor this. And in our denominator we have a difference of cubes. So as a reminder, if you have a difference of cubes, we can factor it as a minus b times a squared plus ab plus b squared. So let's give it a try. The limit as a approaches 2 of a minus 2 over, well, the cube root of a cubed is a. The cube root of 8 is 2. So I'm going to have a minus 2 times a squared plus a times 2, so 2a plus 2 squared, so 4. And then if you factor it properly, something should cancel out, and it does. So now we're evaluating the limit as a approaches 2 of 1 over a squared plus 2a plus 4. And now direct substitution is no problem. 1 over 2 squared plus 2 times 2 plus 4. That's 1 over 12. And there we are. And we can actually try this strategy for a previous example where we use the conjugate. So for this example here, instead of multiplying the denominator by the conjugate and the numerator by that conjugate, we can try this change of variable method. So let's give it a try. So the part that we don't like would, might be this. So let a equal the square root of x. And if that's what a is equal to, a squared would equal x when we raise both sides to the power of 2. And if x is 9, a would be the square root of 9, which is 3. 
So now let's replace everything. Instead of the limit as x approaches 9, we're going to do the limit as a approaches 3. Instead of x, I'm going to write a squared. Instead of the square root of x, I'm going to write a. And now I can factor this. And this is actually a lovely factoring because we have a difference of squares. And the a minus 3s cancel out. And we're left with the limit as a approaches 3 of a plus 3. And I can do my direct substitution now. 3 plus 3 is 6. And there we are. So now, when you get that indeterminate form, when you try direct substitution, you can always try to factor your function. You can try rationalizing the numerator or denominator using a conjugate, or you can try changing the variable when you have something like a square root or a cube root or anything, any rational type of exponent. Now, the final thing we will look at are some properties of limits, and we've already seen some of these. So if you're evaluating the limit as x approaches a, and we're going to be evaluating that limit for all of these properties, of a constant k, the limit will just be k. If we're evaluating the limit of x or any polynomial, we're just allowed to directly substitute, so it would be a. If you're evaluating the limit of multiple functions at the same time, and those functions are being added and subtracted, or they're being multiplied, or they're being divided, we can break that down into two limits, the limit of f at x, the limit of g of x, and then apply the appropriate operation between those two limits, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Finally, if you have the limit as x approaches a of a function that's being multiplied by a constant or raised to the power of an exponent, you can just take that outside of the limit. So take the constant outside of the limit and multiply it into the limit afterwards. Or take the exponent outside of the limit, do your limit, and then apply the exponent. So let's give this a try with our final example. So we're going to use limit properties to evaluate the following expressions. If we know that the limit of f at x as x approaches 4 is 3, and the limit of g of x as x approaches 4 is negative 1. So notice we're not actually told what f at x and g of x are. So in the first example, we want the limit as x approaches 4 of the square root of 3 times f at x plus g of x to the power of 2. I can only sub in these numbers, 3 and negative 1, if I end up with the limit of f at x, the limit of g of x. So I need to use those properties to get the limit of f at x and g of x on their own. So we need to get rid of that square root, that 3, that exponent of 2, and put them outside of the limits. So first I'm going to use the property about the exponent. Remember a square root is just the same as an exponent of a half. So I'm going to say I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 4 of 3 times f at x plus g of x all squared. I would do that first, and then I can apply that exponent of a half at the end. Now I'm going to use the rule that if I'm adding two functions, I can split it into two limits. So the limit as x approaches 4 of 3 times f at x plus the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x squared. And then all of that would be to the power of a half. And the final properties I'm going to use, well, if there's a constant, I can just take it outside the limit. If there's an exponent, I can lift it out of the limit as well. So I'm going to have 3 times the limit as x approaches 4 of f at x. Well, this is fantastic because I know what that value is now. Plus the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x. And then I'll raise that to the power of 2. And again, that's fantastic because I know that that is equal to negative 1. So now I'm finally allowed to replace the limits with 3 and negative 1. So I'll have 3 times 3 plus negative 1 squared and all of that to the power of a half. So that'll be 
9 plus 1, so 10 to the power of a half. So the square root of 10 would be our answer here. So even though we don't actually know f at x or g of x, we could still evaluate this limit by applying those limit properties. So let's try it for one more. Here I have the limit as x approaches 4 of this rational. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is deal with this fraction. Okay, I know I can write that into two limits, the limit of the numerator divided by the limit of the denominator. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to do a few steps in one. If I know I can split it off like that, I'm also going to split off within the numerator and denominator. In the numerator, I have the multiplication of f at x and g of x. So I can split those off into two different limits and then add it with the limit of 5. In the denominator, I know I can remove that constant outside the limit and that exponent of 3 outside the limit. So I'm going to apply all these properties, unlike the previous example, all in one go. So we're going to have the limit as x approaches 4 of f at x times the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x, because we know with multiplication we can split it into two limits being multiplied, plus the limit as x approaches 4 of a constant. I also know that that's just going to be 5. I'll use that property later on. Divided by, well, if I were to take the limit of the den denominator, I know I can first remove the constant outside the limit. I also know I can lift that exponent outside the limit. So I'll find the limit of g of x first, then I'll cube it, then I'll multiply that by 3. So there it is being done all in one go, which you can do, or you can do it in multiple steps, your choice. But now I have the freedom to turn this into 3, this into negative 1, this, well I'm not using the information from above, but I know the limit as x approaches anything of a constant is that constant over 3, and then the limit of g of x we already know is negative 1 to the power of 3. And now we can clean. So that's going to be negative 3 plus 5, which is 2, over negative 3, which I'm just going to take the negative and put it out front for my final answer. And there we are. So when evaluating limits, we can use properties like we just did, or we can use direct substitution, we can use some logic, we can divide our terms by the highest exponent term. If we're evaluating the limits of rational functions, we can factor, we can rationalize, we can change variables, lots of different strategies.